from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell, back in London after a really lovely week's holiday in France, managed to do paddle boarding and kayaking and hiking, all the things I love doing. Uh, now preparing for the Cricket Riders Club lunch, so our media uh, awards will get presented next week, so quite a lot of work to do uh, around that. The domestic season uh, has now finished, and of course the, the international season finished just last weekend at Lords with the women's match. That was a quiet one, wasn't it? <laughs> Yes, I'm, we might come to that discussion, but it's Jim <laughs> Maxwell for the ABC here in Sydney. And uh, just as well, they're not starting the domestic competitions in Sydney because, yes, it's raining again. This must be the wettest year Sydney's ever had. And uh, it's threatening uh, the beginning of round two of our Premier Cricket competition again. But uh, at least it's sunny in other places where various competitions are underway. And uh, that's a good sign. So hopefully we'll get a break in the weather. Well, I feel for you, Jim. Hello, this is Charu Sharma for All India Radio. I'm in Ahmedabad in Gujarat, where it's nice and warm and dry. I'm here for the 36th edition of the National Games, which is sort of like the Indian Olympics, the opening ceremony today. Uh, Cricket-wise, of course, there was a fair amount of criticism for, let's not talk about what happened at Lords a short while back, as I'm sure we will soon, but for the <laughs> Indian medium paces in the men's department. But uh, nine for five, uh, they had a, uh, South Africa on the match, and I suppose the critics have moved away from criticizing the Indian medium paces for a while because they seem to have come to the party. But uh, they moved to some other sphere, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon. But it's good to see you, Jim and Charu, and we will talk about that final one day international between England and India. But first on Stumped this week, well, it seems everything touched by the Australian women's team turns to gold. Earlier this year, the Aussies claimed the first Commonwealth Games gold medal in T20 cricket after beating India by nine runs in a tense final at Edgbaston. Former Australian spinner Shelley Nitschke was the coach in an interim capacity then, helping to guide the team to victory. She's now been rewarded with the head coach role on a permanent basis. Nitschke played over 100 matches for Australia across all formats and had been interim coach since May when Matthew Mott departed for England men. And we've got Shelley with us now on the programme. Shelley, welcome to Stumps and congratulations on the job. You must have felt fairly confident about getting it, did you? Oh, thank you. Yeah, look, I think I was obviously in a in a reasonable position after being in the in the interim role for a few months when we went through the had the recruitment process. So, um, but no, it it was just nice to I guess find out that that I'd been given the role on a on a permanent basis and just uh, looking forward to I guess getting stuck in. Yeah, how satisfying is that for you on a personal basis in terms of your coaching journey? Yeah, it's you know it's obviously been a, a massive high point for me after being with the team for four years and um, Moddy moving on and, and giving the first of all that opportunity to to be the interim coach but then to go through the process and I guess win the win the role of my merits it's pretty rewarding and um, you know we've got an amazing bunch of players and support staff so I know that I've got some really good people around me as well. Hi Shelley, Jim Maxwell in Sydney, nice to be talking to you. Uh, hopefully the sun is shining up there where you are but um, just looking back during Matthew Mott's uh, seven-year tenure as the coach, the Australian team won two T20 World Cup titles, three Ashes series and two women's championships before lifting the coveted World Cup in April this year. How do you manage to keep goals setting when Australia keep winning everything uh, there is to win and with a leg in the air, as it were, at the moment? Yeah, look, it's a it's a good question. I think it's about sort of making sure that we're we're staying pretty grounded, keep resetting, and and keep set, setting ourselves some challenges and keep evolving with the game. You know, we've obviously lost um, Ray Change more recently to retirement, which is a big loss for us. So that presents an, a challenge and an opportunity for someone to step up. And and we also know that um, you know teams are, are coming for us. You know, India pushed us way too hard more than we'd like in the in the Commonwealth Games. So we, we certainly know that, that those, te those teams are coming for us and closing the gap. So I think it's just about finding ways to, to stay motivated, keep evolving and, and really finding that desire to, to stay on top and stay ahead of the game. 
You mentioned Rachel Haynes and, and her retirement, the, the the gap that she leaves. So just a, a couple of questions around personnel. Um, first of all, I guess Elise Perry's prospects of forcing her way back into the T twenty side. And then also how Meg Lanning is, is doing at the moment because she's been taking an indefinite leave from the game. Yeah, like I said before, Rach leaves a big hole for us. I think both on and off the field, um, for those that, that know Rach really well, know how much of an incredible leader she is. Um, I think her performances speak for themselves. We can all see what she does on the field, but it's what she does off the field and the and the leadership around the group is is really difficult. So, you know, that leaves leaves a hole in our, in, in our team and, and whether that's Pez that comes into that T20 um, team or, or someone else, I think there's a real opportunity there. And, you know, we've got a lot of domestic cricket with the WBBL and opportunities for someone to stick their hand up. So there's there's definitely, you know, opportunity, whether it's it's Pez or, or someone else. But I'd be excited to see moving forward where that finishes up and, and who really takes that next step. And look, as for Meg, I think it's just come out recently that she's not playing in the in the WBBL. So we're sort of giving her her space at the moment and yeah, letting her reassess things and, and sort of see where she's at. We sort of don't have any any further indication on that at the moment, but um, you know, I think it's it's really important for her that we we give her that space and, and hopefully she, she comes back to the game in her own time. Yeah, quite. I, mean, I imagine you would hope that she would be able to lead the team at the T20 World Cup, but the priority is, is, is make herself and what she wants to do. Yeah, 100%. Like, I think, you know, everyone's been really respectful of that, which has been great, which is exactly what she needs. She's been a fantastic leader and player for us over, you know, a long period of time and been involved at this level since she was, a, I think, a teenager. So I, I think she sort of just reached a point where she, she just needs to uh, take a bit of a break. And I think everyone's really empathetic with that and, and can fully understand sort of why. So, yeah, I guess we all want to see Meg back playing the game, but it, I think it's just about her and, and what makes her happy. Shelley, it's been great to speak to you. Um, good luck for, well, the, the, the domestic season comes first and then the internationals after that. But, but thanks for being with us on Stumps and congratulations on the role. No worries. Thanks for having me. From the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on All India Radio. Now then, to the story that grabbed the headlines and immediately sparked a lively debate on social media. It was at Lords barely a week ago when the third One Day International between England and India's women became remembered for what happened right at the end. I was there. I was watching from the stands uh, at the climax of what had been well, a low-scoring game, and it was just bubbling up. England were nine down, looking down and out. But England's Charlie Dean, their number 10, was closing in on a half century and threatening to win the game in an unlikely final wicket stand. Things had got tense. She got to within 17 runs of an England win with one wicket left when the bowler, Deepti Sharma, ran her out by stopping in her delivery stride and whipping off the bails at the non-striker's end before she bowled the ball. Dean was advancing out of her crease as the bowler was about to bowl, what's known as backing up. And so Dean was out. Now, the laws allow it. It's still seen as a controversial dismissal, though, and still commonly called a mankad, named after the Indian batter Vinu Mankad, who was the first player to affect that type of run out uh, in a test match in 1947. So it, it is perfectly within the laws of the game, but a lot of people don't believe it's in the spirit of the game and few issues in cricket divide fans and players so vehemently. So where do you both stand on it? Chara, I'll come to you first because you'll have seen all the all reaction right. on the Indian side. <laughs> all right, let's roll up our sleeves on this one. For starters, I would like to very quickly, on behalf of the Munkard family, object to that term because I think the family on many occasions has said, please, you know, let's not vilify the family. And we'll I believe call there it a are... Runner. Let's do that. Yeah, well, non-strikers run out. And I believe yeah. there were at least... Uh, a couple of incidences before Munkard in cricket uh, where the non-striker was run out by the bowler. So it's just one of those unfortunate things where it's named after somebody whose family is certainly uh, not very happy at all. So I'm going to avoid that term. But even recently, the ICC has cemented this law. And they've done it, according to me, for a reason, because people were taking very unfair advantage and not staying within the spirit of the game by backing up too much. And even young Charlie Dean, I mean, I feel for her with the tears and everything else, but she was walking in, in such a an unaware fashion. She just kept walking on without... Uh, 72 without times. Any yes. Did you say but, 72 but even, times in her innings? Correct. And and even on the, the, the one that she was run out, I mean, she was completely unaware of what the bowler was doing, where the ball was. I mean, she was just walking with no look towards the bowler. So... 
but there is some element of 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 lack of innocence there because one is taking a lot of advantage of, of, of backing up and in cricket now we hear about the parlance that throw to the the danger end which is the non-striker's end because the non-striker is going to make the crease anyway because he or she has taken you know four or five steps and and, and therefore has the advantage now all of that was seen by the icc and that's why the icc kind of said all right let's clamp down on this because there's too much advantage being taken by one batsman compared to the other jim i think i know your opinion on it from previous discussions, <laughs> previous instances. Well, let's get a couple of things straight for a start. Um, in cricket, has never been a gentleman's or a gentlewoman's game, right? From the time that it became fashionable as a sport because people gambled on it. You know, from the time WG Grace put the bales back on after <laughs> he, he was given out. Um, I mean, we, we've, we've all always had something unscrupulous around but for me, it's a very bad look. And I would like to see the warning rather than uh, the bowler do what was done the other day. Mind you, Josh Butler was done by Ashwin some time ago. He was miles out of his crease. It just seemed to me in this case, okay, she'd walked out of her ground a little casually perhaps, but th there was a complete intent from the bowler to do what she was going to do as she came in. That's what I don't like about it. If someone's traipsing off into the distance, yeah, either knock the bales off or at least in the spirit of the game, if that still exists, give them a warning and say, look out. So look, it's a bad look. I understand it's within the laws and it's no longer considered unfair plays, in inverted commas. Um, but is this the way to play the game, particularly when it's in the crunch? Um, but the one thing it must do is make people at the non-strikers end realise that they're not allowed, uh, for fear of losing their wicket, to leave their crease until the ball has been dispatched. So m maybe more batters uh, will be watching the bowler's arm rather than just cruising off in, an in expectation. I tell you what, though, one thing about that match uh, between England and India at Lords was that it, the incident at the end completely overshadowed the retirement of India's legendary fast bowler, Julan Goswami. So let's give a good bit of time now to pay tribute to her because she was playing her last game in international cricket after a career that started back in 2002. She retires at the age of 39 as the world's leading wicket taker in women's one day internationals, 255 in her 204 matches. Charu, how will she be remembered? Well, in a class of one because she's been there for a very long time. Just as Mithali, I suppose, their career has intersected for many, many well, decades. And the leader for a lot of other Indians to take up the concept or the art of medium pace bowling, because just like in the men's uh, arena, going back to perhaps the late 70s, when India were to that point of time, very shy of medium pace or the fast bowlers. And, you know, sometimes in test matches, they used to bowl two or four overs and that's it. And the spin used to take over. But after Kapil and quite a few others, there was, I mean, medium paces are coming out of every street now in India. And I think Julan will take that uh, credit for ensuring that there are many young Indian women who now feel and believe that they can be fast bowlers or medium pacers as well. And we see that happening now. I mean, India have a fair number of go-to fast bowlers, and I have no doubt in my mind that they will thank Julan for leading the way, for showing the way. She, of course, was a little exceptional because she's a lot taller than most other average Indian girls, and she used that to very good advantage. I don't think we're still anywhere close in terms of speed uh, as, as uh, the bowlers of some of the leading uh, uh, women cricket nations, but there's this clamor now, there's this awareness that we too can be medium pacers who are effective and who are dependable. Yeah, and do you know what? A number of times she, she said and, and said to me in an interview as well that she modelled herself and maybe her, her action on the great Glenn McGrath. And he similarly was not, you know, bristling aggression in that way. <laughs> and, and Julan, I mean, I remember watching her for the very first time in the 2005 Women's World Cup in South Africa. You know, those long strides, easy action, wicket taking ability. And she was always gracious, always humble. And I think she has stayed that way throughout her career. Hugely like popular, huge amount of respect is what I was getting from from all the England players and indeed all the messages, you know, she's had on social media from her, you know, opponents in the Australian team and, and others around the world. And probably a shame that within her career, she wasn't able to win a World Cup with India for sure. And there were moments at the end of that match at Lords, and this was the sad part, her teammates began to, to carry her off the field 
And there was still a backdrop of booze ringing around Lords at that point. And not just from the England supporters, from Indian fans as well. But those booze did soon turn to cheers. And then she had a wonderful moment when she was doing a lap of honour at the end. And again, it just made me think how many great women's players have retired from the game and retired in front of, you know, smattering of friends and family as the game was, you know, a decade or, or more ago. Whereas Julan, at the age of 39, with the progress the women's game has made, made her farewell at Lords in front of busy stands. I mean, the full 20,000 weren't quite there at the end, but so many were, and they were rising to her and applauding and hoping for a wave back and taking photos, asking for autographs and selfies. I just thought, what, what a wonderful way uh, to be able to exit the game. One final thought before we say goodbye on the, the run out at the non-strikers end, because it did make me look back actually at, at, at some previous incidences. And it's only happened four times in men's test matches, not in my lifetime. The last one in a test was in 1979, but in women's T20. And we talked about this on Stumps at the time. Do you remember the Cameroon bowler who affected four runouts like that in the space of two overs in a World Cup qualifier against Uganda last year? That was Maver Duma. <laughs> of course, there was Joss Butler in the IPL and, and against Sri Lanka as well. But yeah, it just made me think of Maver Duma and the, and the conversation that, that she um, created when she did that just last year. So you'll be able to find that if you listen, listen back on Stump. We had a chat about that too. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week. Stumped on All India Radio. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sports and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. And check us out on YouTube as well. You'll find us if you go to the BBC World Services YouTube channel. Thanks to Chari Sharma and Jim Maxwell. And of course to all of you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Stumped is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.